Welcome to Grand Tactician the Civil War 1861 to 1865. This is a brand new campaign and it's going to be a union campaign starting in the summer of 1861. If you're new here and you enjoy Grand Tactician content, then check my channel out. There are a bunch of playlists. We've, con we've finished a few campaigns here. We've finished the Confederate campaign from 1861 just now. So that started in the early start and went for over 30 episodes. We've also finished an 1864 Confederate campaign, which was great to play. We've also finished a summer start 1861 CSA campaign. So again, Confederates. Uh, the only Union campaign I've done so far had to be abandoned after a few episodes because of an update that came in and it really messed the game up quite a lot. We had armies teleporting all over the place. So <laughs> I decided to call that a day after I think it was seven episodes. But anyway, I'm hoping for better things with this one. <laughs> we are in 1.06. Uh, and by all accounts, this is a, a good update and the AI has been improved. So I would like to get my butt kicked. <laughs> I don't know if I will. I'm, I'm, I may. But either way, if you're a regular follower of the channel, then you will know that I said I was going to take a little while off from Grand Tactician. But actually, the lure of the game is too strong and I'm going to go straight back into it. Um, I enjoy playing this game and I really fancy doing a union campaign. So we're going to start in the summer of 1861, like I said. And let's set this game up. So, for those of you who are new here and aren't familiar with this channel, uh, then these videos will be chaptered. I always chapter my videos, or 99.9% .9 of the time they'll be chaptered. Um, so, if you don't want to watch any of the setup, any of the bits and pieces that I'll be doing here, then just skip ahead to wherever you want to go to. Basically, with this being the first episode, chances are will be a little longer than usual. So that's usually the case with my first episodes, with most first episodes of this game, I think. Because people talk through the strategy that they've got to come and, you know, the other bits and pieces while we're at it. So yeah, uh, we're going to set this up. We're going to just start campaign. I'll, we'll have a quick look through the options first. If I mean, I don't know what, what we normally do. I mean, usually I have this turned right up, but I've had to turn it down. I, I really don't know why, but for some reason, my PC really struggles with this game when there's more than, say, 60,000, 70,000 on the field when we have the graphics right up. Even though, I, I mean, I've got like an RTX 3070 graphics card in there, which, you know, sh should be doing the business, no bother. Uh, and, and same with this, I just keep it kind of around here. Um... UI scale, yeah, it's just normal. Downsizing of units in large battles, yeah, again, because it's uh, the slowdown and the lag that I experience. I, I genuinely don't know how. This is a, it's a fairly high end gaming PC, you know. I, it's, I'm baffled by it, but I, I, I don't know. I, I think it happens to some people, not some others, but it definitely happens on mine. So that's how we're rolling with it. Uh, and then the rest is just kind of basic stuff like the sound options and things. I'll find turn right down, obviously, because I'm recording audio while I'm doing it. And I figure you guys probably don't want to hear the looped music at full volume the whole way through while watching. Um, yeah, so we keep it. You, yeah, okay, this is all just the, the normal crap. So, okay. Uh, start campaign. So, like I say, we're going to play the Union. We're going to start in summer 1861. Uh, we're going to play this on very hard and we're going to stick him up to very high. Uh, maybe just elevate it. I don't know. I, I take it between this because if you stick one very high, then sometimes the AI seems to be suicidal almost and just attacks you again and again and again and again. And that it sort of takes away from the fun of the game, if you like, and it makes it a bit too easy. But uh, let's keep it on elevated, very high and elevated. I think that's fair. So with the very high, that's the that's the highest it can go. So adjusts AI national morale, available recruits, casualty ratios, experience gain, morale recovery, military experience, and fighting spirit for increased difficulty. So it just make, it makes the game a bit harder. So we're going to play summer of 1861, July the 8th, start 1861, over by Christmas. Random. Now, I'm not going to assign the AI a random personality because, like, you don't know what you're going to get. We'll just keep it on historic. Um, choose up to three policies. Obviously, this is a biggie in the game. It sets up kind of your start and, and your strategy, so to speak. So let's go through these. So the ones that are selected are Kansas as a free state, industrialization, which we'll retain, and Indian wars. So Kansas is a free state. I think I'm going to keep that one as well. Encourage the anti-slavery movement in Kansas, northern support in Kansas, plus 25, and plus 5 in all free states. So that's a good one for keeping that uh, support up. 
and I think that's that's a good policy to keep. Same with industrialization. I mean, the no- you're the North, you're the Union, the Federals, the Yankees, whatever you want to call them, <laughs> the US, uh, the Northern government, basically. And, and we want industrialization because we are an industrial power. So we want to produce our own weapons. It's not like being in the South, where industrialization is a crazy little thing. That I, I mean, I do usually pick it, but like you need to build your industry from pretty much nothing in the South. Uh, Indian Wars. Now, I'm not sure on this one. I, I think I'm going to take that one off. So let's have a quick read of this one. Uh, Continue the policy of relocating the indigenous tribes with force when necessary to allow American settlers to expand their territories. This requires the US regular army to increase in size to cover the vast frontier and will keep the army fighting uh, in the ensuing Indian wars. Military experience in the Union and CSA plus five and Union morale plus five. So it does give you a uh, a little morale boost. But on the whole, I don't think it's worth keeping that one on. Some more interesting policies that we could look at. The Union Pacific Railroad. I like that one. Uh, So support the construction of the Union Pacific Railroad. Uh, Excuse me. I am a little bit full of cold, so my voice is a bit croaky. I've I've had this cold. It's completely irrelevant, but I've had this cold for about... Two months. It keeps coming and going. It's really annoying. (laughs) Anyway, back to it. Uh, Support the construction of the Union Pacific Railroad. Connecting the Atlantic and Pacific coasts will increase trade with the Western states. The game will start with the Union Pacific Railroad built and the Union controlling trade at the Pacific coast. Union credit rating plus two. Railroad transport capacity and construction speed plus 25. That's it's actually a pretty damn good one. It's kind of it's an underrated one, I think, but maybe we'll not go with that one. Security measures. Uh, I'm, I'll not read this one. Um, it means CSA national morale minus five. Uh, it's basically we're going to stop weapons going to the south and they'll start with 50% less ships and weapons. I, I don't want to do that one because I think that'll hamper the AI quite a lot. Bread basket. A policy for America to feed the world. All farms will start the campaign with higher uh, upgrade levels. Again, a better European relations. I'm not bothered about European relations. Um, I mean, I will be if they say <laughs> if the CSA manages to get the Europeans involved in the war, but I doubt that'll happen. Enforce Neutrality Act. Enforce the 1794 Neutrality Act. This will prevent adventurers and filibusters from freely pursuing their endeavours in Latin America. Relations with European nations greatly improved, with the chance of intervening uh, intervention against the Union minus ten. The policy is required for level four and five diplomacy policies. I mean, again, I'm not going to bother with that one. I don't think. Support abolitionism. Official support for hardline abolitionists will ensure that any southern sympathies within the Union will be kept in check, discouraging secession. Southern support in all slave states within the United States, minus 10. So, like your Maryland's and Delaware, places like that, there'll be less support. But, I don't know. Go west. Encourage people to move to the west coast of the United States. Northern support in California and Oregon, plus 25. Population, plus 20%. Recruitment becomes available in these states. The trade capacity of the Santa Fe and Oregon trails is doubled. Like this, I like this one. Uh, The Underground Railroad, basically supporting escaped slaves coming to the north. Uh, initial slave work, workforce for the CSA minus 10% with annual reductions of 5% e- like every year and annually obviously <laughs> increasing production costs and reducing available recruits in the south that's again it's a good one but I think that will hamper the AI substantially I- I'm going to steer away from that one so I like the idea of having to go west we can recruit troops from California and Oregon and we'll have extra trade I like that So let's go with that. So we're going to go with Kansas, a free state. We're going to go with Go West. And we're going to go with industrialization. Of course, that's that's a given industrialization for me. That's a given on uh, on any union campaign. Well, on any campaign, actually. Even if I'm the South, I'll pick industrialization 99% of the time. Uh, So yeah, so there we are. And we're going to leave the AI, like I say, on historic quick look at the overview here so we're starting with equal morale 95 each experience a little lower for us i guess that reflects that maybe the south is a little bit more militarily minded and a lot of the commanders from the military are from the south i guess i mean number of ships they start with 35 we start with 75 and the army's 75,000 and 50,000. so there we have it uh realism options 
auto manage no 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 feuds i don't play with feuds ever i, I just don't like it it's annoying like it's, it's annoying for the player and i think it's it makes it harder again for the ai and i don't want things to be harder for the ai at all I, w I want i want this to be a good campaign i want the ai to give us a good fight here now hopefully it'll be another 30 40 episode campaign and i mean i would genuinely love it if the ai managed to defeat me like honestly i, I really would obviously you always want to win but i would love it if the ai was good enough to defeat us so that was quite a lot of talking and there's still a little bit more talking to come we're going to talk about the strategy of the game what are we doing i'm basically i'm going to do what the union did up to a point anyway we're going to get that anaconda plan in place which is why i used it for the thumbnail <laughs> which i don't know if you guys noticed but on the thumbnail it's like a picture of scott's anaconda plan like a, a, a painting of it i guess uh, and i really quite liked it so I, i'm gonna use i'm gonna we're gonna do that we're gonna strangle the trade out of the confederates basically we're, we're out of the confederacy rather we're gonna work on pushing down the mississippi and we're not gonna be mega aggressive in virginia i mean like i always hold back in virginia whether i'm the union or the confederates basically because it's it's it sucks men in a lot <laughs> um but yeah so we what we need to do right we need to build up our fleets a little bit we'll strangle out all the major ports if we can i mean i'm sure he'll have something to say about that the ai but let's find out we'll find out see what old jeff davis ai has to say about that um but yeah we'll work down the mississippi we'll secure our central region we want to kentucky secure and tennessee for sure we'll launch invasions through missouri down into arkansas you know we'll do pretty much what the union did we'll try anyway that's the plan so initially the main issue for the union is that their contracts a lot of their contracts are only very short term 90 day volunteer contracts and you're going to lose a massive chunk of your force especially in the east within 24 days well, i think it's 24 days it's, it's, it's not long anyway whatever it is it's 20 something days i think that you have your troops for um well actually we'll just we'll load it in and we'll see so we'll, we'll let, let's go yeah so we'll have a quick look at our forces but like I say, a big issue is that you lose a lot of your men within 24 days. So it's, it's kind of imperative that you push south immediately in Virginia and engage Beauregard and or Johnston. We need that victory on southern soil as soon as possible because the Union suffers national morale penalties for the whole time until it gets its first victory on Virginia soil. Well, on southern soil, sorry. So... Like, one of the reasons why I wanted to choose the Union, I've hardly ever played as the Union, uh, and one of the reasons why I wanted to play as the Union here is because I think, like, I mean, the original thought would be, the obvious thought would be, sorry, that the it's harder to play as the Confederacy. It kind of is, because you're, kind, you're constrained by uh, material availability and things like that. But, let's just skip this. It's just the intro movie. I'm sure you've all seen it. Um, but the problem that you have is that the Union, uh, that, that as the Confederacy, you can just sit back and defend. There's no onus on you to attack, really, unless you want to. Whereas the Union, you are the aggressor, really. You are the aggressor in this fight. You're invading the South. That's, 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 that's how it is. And as I say all the time, invading and attacking is far tougher than defending without a doubt so that's one of the reasons why i thought let's do a union campaign plus i've, I've hardly played with the union so let's see what i was talking about here i was talking about the army enlistment so we're starting off here this is a nice army thirty-two thousand nine hundred and ninety men but 24 days 24 days 24 days 24 days and 24 days and we can go through all of them and most of them are over in 24 days in fact all of them except for the volunteer brigade which is there for another 33 months okay 
And that's the case for both these armies in the east. I think it might even be the case for the other armies. Let's just check. Uh, 24 days. 24. 24. Yep, so 24 days all around for those guys. So let's have a look here. Estimated loss of manpower through contract expiries within three months, 28,000. We've only got 71,000 in the field. So 28,000 from that doesn't leave that many left over, does it? So what we need to do here, we need to get a recruiting force put in, Wash in place in Washington, basically, or somewhere around here, Baltimore maybe, just, just behind the front lines, and we'll need to recruit some troops immediately so we can replace these guys when they go. I mean... We won't lose all those men from the units. It said about 50% will re-enlist. So that's something to be very much aware of. Right. So what's the plan then? Something else to be mindful of is, if you look at our forces here, we've got a 1,000 men in the West Virginia militia here. This is our furthest west unit until we reach down here, almost in Arkansas, where Nathan Lyon is with 5,600 men. So we've got, I don't know how far this is, but it must be, I don't know, best part of a thousand mile, maybe? I have no idea about the U US geography, but it must be a, a fair hike anyway. So we've got no troops at all from the Virginia border, all the way through Ohio, Kentucky, Indiana, Illinois, Missouri, until we reach down here at the very, very border of Missouri and Arkansas. You can see the borders just here. <clears throat> and that leaves your heartland very much open. So the first thing we're going to do is recruit an army somewhere here. Illinois or Indiana, and we'll start building that up. It doesn't need many men in, but we do need some. Yeah, so we will need some men in there. We start off with seven armies in the field. Uh, one, two, three, four. Well, it says five, actually. Why does that say seven when I click on here? Oh, no, it says five. Where the hell did I get seven from? Maybe I looked at two and five, make seven. But anyway, so we've got five armies to start with. The Army of Northeastern Virginia, the Department of Pennsylvania, the Army of the West under Lyon there, the Army of Occupation with uh, McClellan, and then the West Virginia Militia with Benjamin F. Kelly. That's a thousand men. That is not an army. <laughs> that is a tiny brigade. Um, but anyway, we'll have a quick look through our fleets. Uh, actually, it's a bit easier if we just look on here. So we've got a few fleets on the go. We've got the Atlantic Blockade and Squadron right here. We're going to move them in and we'll set some blockades up. Let's get started with this. This is going to be our first little game start. So if you're, if you're new to this game, this radius here indicates how far we can blockade. So anything in that radius will get blockaded. Obviously, we've only got seven ships in the squadron. So I guess it'll, it's not going to be a perfect blockade, but it should be okay. So what we're going to do, we're going to move these guys into here and give blockading orders. So they should blockade all these ports if they're in range. We've also actually got the uh, the Potomac Flotilla. I was going to say the Flying Flotilla, Flotilla. I think that's what it's called initially. That's got 13 ships in it. 13 small ships. Very small ships. But they'll do to add to the blockade here. It should help block everything up. Let's move them down. Let's give them blockade and orders. Also, so that's those two fleets there. We've got the Gulf Blockading Squadron down here. Again, the same deal. You can, you can see how far it's going to block. Oh, interesting. He's actually got these guys... <laughs> mobilized up and on the move immediately so he's obviously not bothered about this area down here which makes sense because realistically am I going to strike at Pensacola? I don't think so not immediately that's for sure um, but anyway so let's block this up we're going to block these two little ports with this fleet and we'll probably send another fleet to blockade Pensacola itself Unless we can block all three, but I, I don't think the radius is big enough for that. Next up, the Mississippi River Squadron. That's one ship. So that's one ship up at St. Louis. We're going to leave them there for now. We'll build that up a little bit. 
Uh, this Atlantic blockading squadron just outside Wilmington. Yeah, that's okay. Let's move them in a little bit. And get the blockading orders on the go. Next one, the third Atlantic blockading squadron. Now that's Charleston and Savannah. Let's move them in a little bit. And set blockading orders. <laughs> the second Gulf squadron. Okay, so if we place this guy just right, kind of here, I think we can block New Orleans, uh, Biloxi, and Mobile as well. I think. We'll see. And the third Gulf blockading squadron is down here off the coast of Texas. We're going to want to block uh, Christie Port. I would also like to block Galveston, but I don't think we're not going to be able to get all three of these ports. At least I don't think so. We'll give these guys blockade orders and they should move in. So that that's the, the beginnings of a blockade. We will need more ships, but we have got some more ships actually. The Union starts with some ships in harbour. I mean, some are still being built, obviously. Uh, the USS John Hancock's at 50%. So, obviously, if they if this is not 100%, that means the ship is either in repair or being constructed still. But we do have some steamers and, and some other ships available that we can give out. Sloops of War. Um, quite a lot of these, actually, look. Steam Sloop, Sloop of War. These are perfectly capable of blockading ports. That is something that I will do off camera. Like, I'll, I'll put the fleets together off camera and then we'll move them into place, probably in the episodes, but I might do some between episodes as well. So, anyway, in terms of the front lines, I mean, obviously, I'm sure you're familiar with this. This is how it all runs. So, the, the border is kind of here, just Maryland and Virginia. We will push into Northern Virginia and control that section of the map for, for sure. Um, we'll push up the peninsula. We'll we'll do some invasions. I mean, we'll we'll get going. We want to control Kentucky as well. We already have influence over a lot of the state, um, and obviously we want to maintain our heartland intact. Ohio, Indiana, Illinois, Pennsylvania. We want to keep the, the the Confederates out of there. Missouri, we want to secure. We want to kick them out of there. We want to take Arkansas. We need to work down the river as well with our fleets. We need to get some ships into the Ohio River and into the Tennessee River. We need to take care of these forts, Fort Donaldson, Fort Henry, and Fort Hyman. Uh, we need to capture Nashville. There's a lot of work to be done. And we don't start with much. So there's nothing much on the go. We do start with a few banks. Available capital. You know, that's, We have got some of this kind of infrastructure in place. Unlike the South. Slavery intelligence so we've got nothing out west so there's a lot of things to be doing there's a lot of things we're going to be building and a lot of things to be getting on with basically we've got a whole war economy to get building nice um so let's get started kind of with the with the game itself We're going to pump some money into the economy. Two and a half million? Yeah, fine. I want to keep this at kind of the medium levels. I want to keep this, except for the important stuff, like the military. I want to ram military spending up. Diplomacy. I mean, some of these diplomacy policies that come through are pretty handy. So we'll, we'll pump a bit in there, but not too much. Not too much into the subsidies. Uh, industry, very important. Let's get this up to high. So we're ramming in to military and industry. The rest is kind of medium and diplomacy very low, but we're fine with that. Now, what are we working on here? We start with Militia Act 2, so we can't get 12-month contracts, which is handy. I think previously when I started as the Union, I think maybe you only started with Militia Act 1 in place for only 3-month contracts, but I can't remember. It's been that long. But what are we working on first? We could do industrialization 2, that's a good one, 34.7 days for that. We could roll with military 2, which then opens up different acts. It opens up conscription, uh, the enrollment act. We could go with militia act 3 for 24 month contracts and more recruits. That's a good one. 
Now, the draft in the South is much better than the draft in the North. The draft in the South extends all contracts to 36 months. In the North, it doesn't do that. At least it doesn't, it, it doesn't say it does that, so I doubt it does. Um, and something to remember with draft units. Draft units cause penalties when you raise them, but draft recruits do not lower national morale if they fill up volunteer units. So that, that's something to bear in mind. So previously, like other gamers, I'm thinking of uh, like Bramber in particular, who I watch, he, he and I would shy away from enrollment acts and drafts because it's not something that we want to go with, really. Because it seems like it's going to hurt your national morale, but really it doesn't do too much damage to your national morale at all. Um, so anyway, so the route that we want to take is the military route to start with, I think. Yeah. Let's roll with Militia Act 3. So we're going to open up the two-year contracts. Next, we may go with Industrialization 2, or we may go with Military 2. Again, this means you can subsidize your military more. It opens up the possibility to make full armies, which is obviously a good one. It also opens up emancipation and the recruitment of black troops, you know, freed slaves or freed men from the north, which is, of course going to really boost our manpower pool which is nice uh, but we also need to keep an eye on the money we also need to keep an eye on what the AI does, what the CSA is doing in terms of uh, foreign intervention, things like that and we also want to go with legal blockade um, because that will then hurt their European intervention chances but you know, it, it we'll see we'll see where we go, but I think this is Military Act 3 is the first one we're going to roll with, and that's going to be 34 days projects we've got nothing available at the moment obviously these will be filling up and let's see where we go and one of the good things about starting as the union is that we can already order rifled weapons in the shape of where are we the springfield rifle musket and we also have eighteen thousand of those suckers available to give out alongside with three thousand Mississippi rifles, which are really good. Um, so, it's not immediately that we require access to more rifled weapons. Not immediately. but we, I mean, we will need them. But what we're going to do right away, we're going to order 25,000 Springfield rifles. They're going to take 138 days to get to us, and they cost $15 million. So, let's get them on order. 25,000 straight away. Artillery, We've only got access to the howitzers at the moment, but we do have a handful of parrots and uh, three-inch ordnance available. Now, for the projects, I want to open up the ability to build parrot rifles and three-inch ordnance rifles. I like both those guns. So, we'll be looking at that. We may also open up legacy rifles, which is something that I really like. I like the legacy rifles. The Mississippi rifle is a great weapon. The Plains rifle is a great weapon. Even... even these days so let's take a look at the mississippi rifle 500 yard range very good accuracy only two and a half rounds per minute that's its only real downside i find but that in all honesty that extra range really makes up for that the springfield ri uh, rifle musket for example only has mediocre accuracy and only 400 yards range but you do get the three rounds per minute so i mean it's not a bad weapon it's a standard rifle and that will do us That'll, that'll see us right. It's, that'll be fine for the majority of our troops. If we can augment it with a few Mississippis and then some better uh, artillery, I think that'll be fine. But for, uh, Obviously, we need some cav weapons. We've got access to nothing at the moment, cavalry-wise. Um, so, at the moment, we can't really get access to anything artillery-wise. 12-pound howitzers. We've got a few stashed away so i might order a handful of them it's order 32 it's enough for a, for a couple of full artillery battalions but i don't want millions of them because they're not great but i mean they're okay but they're not great we want ideally um we want the 12 pound napoleons but they come on a different artillery option that comes with the james rifle now that's i chose that in the last playthrough and i wasn't really that impressed with the james rifle 
However, the Napoleons are good, and it would be great if you could just get the Napoleons, but we can't. Um, actually, I'm going to go with 64, because the time difference is not massive. So 45 days for 32, or 54 days for 64. Let's order 64 12-pound howitzers. So we've got a bunch of howitzers on order, and 25,000 Springfield rifles. So the only problem is with only having access to one of these rifle muskets is that it just you can only have one order going at the time, which sucks a little bit, but, you know, it's just something we'll have to get used to for now. Once we open up the project, we'll open up a source for another rifle, or several rifles if we take the Mississippi rifles and the Plains rifles, etc. Uh, okay, so I feel that, that feels like a, a decent little spot <laughs> where we're at. Yeah, so I've been talking for quite a while now, about half an hour solid. <laughs> it's just a long time for me. I don't usually roll like this in my videos. So normally, if, you, if you're tuning into this channel, the videos won't be like this. It's a little a little more fast-paced. I mean, I'm not like racing through it or anything, but I don't usually sit and explain every little bit and piece that I do. Usually, I'll, I'll, I'll go through the basics. But while we're here, I'm going to, off camera, I'm going to increase... I'm going to give out some weapons, and I'm going to form a new army. When that's done, I'll see you back. All right, then. So I've done a bit of recruiting off-screen. Let's have a quick look at how things are looking. So, again, Army of Northeastern Virginia was there before. Department of the... Blah, blah, blah. These were all here. New armies. Eastern HQ. Under Fremont. Recruiting unit based at Baltimore. We've recruited... 7,610 men with 24 guns. That should go some way towards filling in those gaps left by the guys whose contracts are up in 24 days. So these will be ready in 17 days, 18, 28, 24, 14, and 15 days. Uh, <laughs> I don't know why, but <laughs> as the union, it always gives these strange names and duplicates them quite often so we've got the second battery and the second battery the fourth brigade and these two were both the first brigade so i just changed them to wherever they were recruited from just because i didn't want to have lots of second brigades but uh i suppose it doesn't really make any difference anyway so we've got mccook paul uh, let's have a look at these commanders they're, they're decent i picked up pretty decent ones to bump them up the colonel they're either colonels or like lieutenant colonels or lower and i've bumped them up just to you know get them in there get some experience under their belt mccook's looking pretty good uh gibbs eh, he's okay he'll get better reynolds a solid commander for the artillery there probably end up getting an artillery corps or something if he doesn't get killed before then uh morgan with some more guns and then george mead who's got a brigade down here next up the central hq uh winfield scott with, again, 7,610 men. It's the same force, really. It's just with different commanders. We've got Warren, uh, Governor K. Warren, Joseph Hooker, obviously pretty famous guy. Eventually, his stats look pretty good. I'm sure he'll do himself justice as a brigade commander out here in the central region. Uh, Herbert, a decent political officer. Blake, yeah, again, he's okay. He'll get better. Crittenden, nice again good stats i'm sure you'll get much better and we've given winfield scott hancock the boost from captain to colonel to be in command of this brigade next up we've got the missouri department again exactly the same setup i didn't actually realize they were all exactly the same when i was doing them but uh, it makes sense Seven thousand six hundred and ten men uh scammons brigade second brigade again curtis with the second brigade uh, again, solid political commander. He should do well as a brigade commander and probably get higher command. He's decent as well. Uh, Sherman, Thomas W. Sherman, not, you know, William T. Sherman. Eli Long, again, okay stats, he'll get better. And a couple of gun commanders. So we've got some nice forces recruiting in the background here, and that's going to be imperative, I feel. Because we are immediately going to push down here to take on Beauregard. That's, it's a, it's a given. You've got to. Uh, in terms of weapons, I haven't actually given any out. I think we're going to just leave them with what they've got until their contracts expire and we'll take things from there. Both sides are pretty poor weapons, to be honest. And I'm not 100% convinced that all the weapons go back into the pool. I mean, they might do. They might well do. But I, I just don't know. And I don't want to be losing rifles at this early stage of the game if I give them out and then the guys go home with them. <laughs> If you know what I mean. 
Uh, okay. So, let's get started with the campaign real quick. I'm not going to fight a battle in this one. There won't be a battle, but we will push it forward. We may initiate a battle. We're going to push forward with Patterson as well. And hopefully, he can then keep Joe Johnston cooped up in the peninsula as he was supposed to historically but Joe Johnson ended up giving him the slip obviously and as we probably all know helped out Beauregard at the Battle of Manassas let's press play let's get started Civil War so our fleet's on the move straight away We can also push straight down with McClellan, but we'll pull him back. So I've done nothing with these guys. I haven't given any other weapons out. Some of them have already got Springfield rifle muskets, but not many. And like I say, I, I don't want to give them out just to lose them. I, I, you probably don't lose them, but I, I don't want to take that risk. A handful have got Springfield rifle muskets, so uh, quite a few actually. Looks like maybe about half the guys have Springfield muskets, and that's fine. Yeah, so see, he's pulling straight out of there to come and try and come to the aid of Beauregard, which makes perfect sense. Union issues bonds. Oh, hang on. Well, I had intended on checking out that naval engagement that's going on here, but since we've got contact with uh, Borogod's army of the Potomac, I feel like we should probably get to that battle instead. Now, I wasn't even going to put a battle into this video, but uh, actually, <laughs> I am going to, as I'll, I'll edit it in, obviously, that I am going to. Uh, because I thought the video was going to run a bit longer than it, than it did, but it hasn't. It's still fine. We're only at half an hour, so that's that's absolutely fine to add a battle in. I, I don't want these episodes going too long. Obviously, I'm, I'm not bothered if it's about like somewhere around an hour, maybe even an hour and a half if needs be. But I, I don't want them running any longer than that, if I'm honest. Plus, I don't think you guys want to watch me waffling on for that long anyway. So anyway, uh, it's McDowell, the Army of Northeastern Virginia versus Beauregard. I'm actually recording this the day following when I started yesterday's campaign. It's, it's been a bit of a muddle for me here today. It's, I've been very busy. Uh, so anyway, let's let's get it on. Let's get going. Play a battle. So between recording this first section of this video and this section, I've actually been in. I've, I've also queued up a few units of ships and a few extra troops. Uh, we'll go through that after this battle. It'll be a nice way to round off the episode, I feel. The Confederacy feels 19,000 men under Major General Beauregard. The Union fields 32,950 men under Major General McDowell. So obviously, we have got the numbers here, so we should be able to pick up that first victory. But you never know, really. I've seen some good things from the AI in other campaigns that I've been watching. And who knows? Let's just see how this goes. We face an army of the Potomac under PGT Beauregard. We know the numbers, 19,000 and 28 guns. The enemy army is green. Well, we are as well. The reports indicate... Supply situation is outstanding. The supply state of our army is outstanding. What's that famous quote? They are green, but uh, you may be green, but they are green also, or something like that. Anyway, uh, let's have a look. Light rain. A little drizzle won't hurt, even if the men may complain. From a general's point of view, the light rain hinders visibility only slightly, while reducing dust and the lingering of smoke. So it's quite handy, really. Let's have a look at the battlefield here. So it's it's obviously the Bull Run battlefield, which, you know, it was always going to be. Um, all right, so there's a couple of objectives here. Cushing Farm and Sudley Springs. Let's come out of this HQ view, where we're starting off uh, right up here in the corner, by just, just north of Centerville. So we're actually going to attack this way. Yeah. So we're going to have to cross the Bull Run. Um, we'll send some troops across Poplar Ford. We'll pin them at Sudley Ford and Sudley Springs. Ooh, it's some 
awful terrain. Actually, well, maybe we won't actually because the other objective is right here. So we'll take this objective first if we can. Uh, they're bound to defend along the unfinished railway. It's going to be a tricky one. It depends on how he's how he's lined up, actually, depending on what we do. So let's go ahead and have a look at our guys. McDowell, obviously, in charge. The other issue on this map from approaching from this side of Centerville is that there's no roads. But the ground is fairly open. We will have to cross this creek, which, you know, hinders somewhat. But I think we'll be okay. Uh, another thing, the artillery is all attached to divisions here, which I don't like at all, but it'll have to do for now. <laughs> we'll get our guys up a bit closer. We've got no cavalry, uh, so we can't send scouts out. We'll get a little bit closer. We'll see if we can figure out what the Union, uh, what the, <laughs> what the Union, what the Confederates are doing. Um, we'll make our main approach kind of along here till we hit these roads. Then we'll take it from there. So our divisions are Dixon Miles, 5,000 men, 14 guns. Uh, Daniel Tyler with 9,500 men, 13 guns. So he's got a couple of uh, guys who become pretty damn famous, actually, in his division. Uh, we've got William Sherman, uh, Keyes, uh, Corps Commander, and obviously Schenk. I know his name as well. Uh, Richardson as well, I know his name. Oh, Burnside. He ends up commanding the Army of the Potomac, of course, uh, with questionable <laughs> results. He's under David Hunter. Uh, Heinzelman, his division with Oliver Howard, again, uh, holds quite high command. Wilcox and William B. Franklin. And then we have Artillery as well. Who's commanding that one? Ricketts? Don't know. He's got 10 pound parrot, so that's pretty decent. And we've got Runyon's division. I always like Runyon because I like his name. <laughs> Sounds a bit like Onion. Anyway, he's got uh, Taylor. We'll try and keep these guys out of the fight a little because these are the dudes who've got 36-month contracts. So see if we can keep them intact, if possible. Uh, and Baker with another brigade there. All right, so that's how it's looking. Let's not start him off in that creek. Let's move him over here. Um, well, let's get started. It's 7 in the morning. I suspect he's going to be here. He's got to be along that unfinished railway railroad let's get going through here i mean it's going to be a bitch to cross through these woods with the guns but there's nothing much for it to be honest if it looks like a possible thing to do we will send a division over the poplar ford to come around from this side but then we would still have to cross at the sudley church i don't know it's going to be it's it's going to be a, a pig of a battle i think so even though we outnumber the enemy it it doesn't really matter It looks like this unfinished railroad actually acts a little like a road. I didn't realise that. So I'm going to, let's have a look at this terrain. It's fairly open. I mean, obviously it favours the defenders here. Substantially. So maybe we move Dixon's division to here and we could hopefully then see the enemy. As always in my campaigns and battles, I, I don't rush through this stuff if I can help it. Why is why is Dixon Miles still all the way back here with Blenka? I gave that whole core orders to move. Maybe they just didn't fancy it. They were still having their breakfast, maybe. Well, Tyler's just waiting on his guns, which we knew was going to be a problem going through the woods, of course. Another reason why we'll take our time with this. Time's whipping by quite quick because we've got it on times 10 here because obviously everything takes ages. We've got to also remember these are totally raw troops. And for that reason, and the reason that they're armed with m muskets, half of them anyway, we're going to give long-range orders, which is a little less accurate, obviously, but... I always like long-range orders, especially with uh, a new force. Simply because it means they can get their shots off a little earlier. And since we're fighting inexperienced men, also it's possible that we're going to give them morale shocks with more getting more volleys in by the time they get close or we get close. Either way, our guys are exhausted already. 
but actually training good. Untrained. All right, so it must be that was just an anomaly. So Porter's Brigade have good training. I wonder why that is. They must be one of the first ones formed, I guess. Untrained. Untrained. All the rest seem untrained. Yep. All untrained. All exhausted as well. Except for Porter's Brigade. How come they're trained? That's Are they regulars maybe? I really don't know. May have to look it up. But they're very tired, so we need to let these guys recover some cohesion. And then at least we've got some roads to move on after that. So Dixon Miles and his division, I'm moving them up this road just to see if we can spot the enemy. I mean, we might not. They're only going to here for now. We'll push them up further if need be. Heinzelman's guys are still recovering. They've only just gotten in position. Burnside's just getting in position as well. No sign of them at the Cushing farm. But then, we're not very close yet. See, these guys fared quite a lot better on the roads. The artillery still recovering from their march. Burnside still exhausted. Winded. Let's give him another few minutes. Got to move Sherman up. Oh, not Sherman, Tyler. <laughs> hmm, still not spotted. Maybe we'll cross the stone bridge with Heinzelman actually instead of Lewis Ford. Maybe we won't. I need to spot the enemy. We need to see what he's doing, really. I'm going to pop out some skirmishers just to see if we can spot him anywhere. I was sure he'd have some defences along here, along the unfinished railroad, but it looks like he hasn't. He must be set up over here. Oh, there's some cannon fire. All right, so he is over here. He's on this little hill behind. Ah, 12-pound howitzers, damn it. Um, let's get Blanker's skirmishers out as well. These guys are rifle-armed. I'm going to send them over here, and we're going to harass this artillery if we can. Does he only have artillery over here? That would be interesting. Let's go and find out. I am going to advance Heinzelman on this objective. Uh, no, he has not got only artillery there. That would have been too good to be true. He's actually pulling them back, so it's, it's good to see the AI doing like clever things, really. I mean, not that this is mega clever, but uh, it's better than he had performed in some games I've played. Uh, he's got the first brigade behind there as well. Long streets in there. So he's actually throwing forward a brigade to try and push these skirmishers back. Didn't go too well from there. We're behind the fence as well. So he's, he's got parapets behind you and everything. So he's, he's well set up. But I think we'll take him on the flank. We'll try anyway with uh, Miles' brigade. We'll do a bit of skirmishing while we're getting the rest of our guys in place. Uh, Tyler's there. What's he got? He's got parrots. Oh, nice. But will we be able to get a shot with them if we advance? Possibly. I feel like maybe we should set up here. That looks like a nice little hill. Let's do it. 
Tyler's moving in. Runyon has got uh, James Rifles. Excellent. So I'm gonna, we're going to pop Runyon's division just here. Where are the guns? Odd. Oh, Runyon hasn't got guns, that's why. <laughs> Not too odd after all, eh? Well, let's move him up. We'll keep him behind that hill. Hunters with the guns, that's it. Now, I'm going to have to move these individually because if I move the division, he's going to try and move the skirmishers to the same place, which I don't want. So obviously keys, they're probably going to come under artillery fire, I would think. This is a decent position from him. It's quite tricky because I can't really attack him from this flank because I'd have to cross this stream. Or, and even from here, I'd have to cross there, all under fire of his infantry where he set the parapets up quite nicely. However, I would probably just use the fence. Maybe put the parapets a little closer, but, you know, I'm sure it'll work out for him. This is going to be tough. It's always tough to attack. Like, I say it all the time. <clears throat> Let's see how this goes. It's our guy's first battle as well, so... And theirs as well, of course, but still. Um, is it not anybody's first battle? Just wonder if any of these guys were involved in those earlier little skirmishes. But I think all these guys... I've got the first battle deep off. Yeah, even those guys with a good train. Yeah, his guns are firing at our skirmishers. Fifty casualties for them from moving forward into the skirmisher fire there, and one for us. First man to die under our watch in Blenka's skirmishes. All wounded, I suppose. <laughs> uh, we've captured Cushing Farm and it's now switched to a meeting engagement. I wonder if we can get behind... Nah, he won't go. I was wondering if he would slip behind here, maybe he can start firing at, the, at those guns, but he didn't fancy it at all. Can't say I blame him exactly. Oh. We are taking counter battery fire. They're still forming. Um, Let's see if we can give some back with our parrots. We're also going to detach this artillery. So they don't move when I move the division forward for, for the attack. Our skirmishers are keeping those gun as busy as well, which is nice. I'd rather the fire at the skirmishers than our guns. So I did give these guys counter battery orders, but it doesn't seem like they're actually doing that. They are taking fire though. Ooh, it's all those skirmishers. Alright, let's press in here. Are 
They're taking a lot of counter battery fire. And not returning it like I ordered them to. All these skirmishes back. Our pirates are taking an absolute batter, and he's just firing at Evans's detachment instead of not even firing at, at, at a full brigade. Okay, here we go. Skirmishers, uh, let's call Schenk back as well. Ah, uh, Blenker. Why was he Schenk? Heinzelman forward as well. Runyon forward a bit. He's going to be our reserve. Get Miles up on that flank. Let's hope he does a good job of moving in here. Yeah, the damn creek slowing us down a lot. This is a tough spot to attack. Idle. Why don't we just... Why is he getting a... Why is he facing that way? What the hell? Like, he can't actually be serious. He's, like, it, it can't actually be serious. <laughs> so I know we're crossing a creek here, but I don't understand why that has to take an hour. And I don't understand this. Or this, exhausted. They haven't done anything. They just haven't moved. How can he be exhausted? Why are they on the fence? Like, uh, that's some of these, some of these stuff on this game just so, is so annoying and unrealistic. Like, that's just, it's ridiculous, that. Ten casualties in it, and they get, he's just doing nothing. Anyway, it's damn annoying. And, and these guys haven't moved yet. Now the fine is done. Yeah, uh, this kind of thing here, like the unit on the fence, just, I mean, what on earth are you doing? Just pull off the fence and march properly. It's not rocket science. Well, at least Burnside's in range and giving some fire. 
Like, the number of casualties our brigades are suffering here from pretty much nothing is crazy. 30 casualties for Schenk. From where? How? Tiring. I suppose we had to cross a stream. Frustrating and annoying. <laughs> Never mind. Uh, and he is exhausted now and still stuck on this damn fence. That's just. I'm not even going to bother putting him in. Halt. You just stand there and block the artillery, why don't you? When you give a division order like this, it should clearly be a coordinated advance from the division commander. I mean, what the hell, man? Where is the division commander? Why is he stayed all the way back here? Get up there. This go well in defeat for us. It's not start. It hasn't started off very well at all. Uh, we're getting our asses kicked. It's a difficult, difficult place to attack over these plumbing creeks, which are totally overpowered. I mean, you, it's, it's the same for the AI, though. I mean, he's stuck on there. Our oh, guns that I've ordered to move. I mean, it's taken forever and ever and ever. I mean, it's, it's a little fence. Smash it down. Bring the guns through. In the infantry, why would you get exhausted from wandering around there? Well, uh, it's one of the... It's all these gripes. I, I mean, I know I, like, I, I can't play in quite a bit. <laughs> uh, we're starting to do okay on the left there, but... He's moving troops into place. Same with this, when you give a movement order like that, why does the artillery not limber up and then unlimber when they get where they're going? That would make sense. Oh, this brigade broke with a hundred casualties. I mean, seriously? I mean, theirs as well. Was there... Not sure what happened there? Unstable. Yeah, great. Oh, my God. Yep, I think we're going to lose this battle, actually, because all oh my guys are running away with 30 casualties. I mean, I know it's the first battle, but come on, don't disgrace yourself like that. Hundred forty-five losses and forty-two for keys, including his panic flight. Well, at least we managed to break one of his. That's all I can say on that. If I put some skirmishers on now, because these guys are coming on the seventh brigade. And something that bugs me is that there's no way to really alter his orders. I mean, I would like him to just stop and start firing at those guys. Oh, he can't. <laughs> well, sometimes it doesn't work. Keys. Uh, he's got to be defamed for that, surely. I have no idea if this rally thing actually does anything. Shank as well, that was a disgraceful performance. Again, I know it's their first battle, but come on. Right, then unlimber. I'm doing like a thousand things. If you could just unlimber, that would be great. <laughs> I 
this is this is a joke. This on on this fence. You can't tell me anybody thinks that that's realistic in any way. There's a lot of men on this right flank. Sherman's getting in position now. Looks like these guys are running for the hills. Our right needs to hold, that's the key. Germans engaging now. So they are, they've got 600 men. They're still fighting solid, not bothered. No effect on that at all. Ah, we've broken those dudes on the bridge. Okay, Franklin, press on. retreat here should come into fire from Burnside's rifles there as well we need, we need Blanker to hold a little bit more he's done a good job here though Blanker to be honest Nice. This, I mean, I know we, we're beating them now, but the AI has done a damn good job here, to be honest. He was outnumbered, remember, by substantial numbers, and he formed up a decent defensive position here. However, he's kind of also put himself into a bit of a, a bit of a tight spot here. Formed, it didn't look like it. It was imperative to get a victory here, like really, really important, like re the most important battle really, that first one. It means we, we get that uh, victory on Confederate soil bonus, which obviously is, like I say, imperative is the word for it. He's pulling out now. I mean, we knew he was. We could see he was. Just a case of trying to inflict as many casualties on him as possible now. And possibly these guns. It's quite annoying that in 37 minutes his troops just all teleport out. 
I think it was okay. It was touch and go for a second. I was really... Didn't think it was going to go too well. Uh, Dixon Miles' division on the right did a really good job. We did lose a lot of men. Almost 2,000, but they lost a 4,000, so... Got to be happy with that. We have to remember, of course, that uh, we're going to lose a whole big chunk of our troops soon. Because of those enlistments being up. Alright, well, I'm quite happy with that. We did lost, we lost a gun, but he lost all his. 4,000 casualties in the end, or 2,000. But we did, like I say, we outnumbered him by 13,000 men, so he did a good job. It was a nice first battle. I enjoyed that, actually. Apart <laughs> from some frustration about that fence, uh, which always annoys me in this game, that kind of thing. But I should be used to it by now, and you would think I would be, but I'm not. <laughs> so, yeah, a minor federal victory. I think that's fair. So, Beauregard should retreat now towards uh, Richmond, Fredericksburg, certainly. Brigadier General Hunter has become famous, and Schenck has fallen to disgrace. That's, we'll get him out of that command. Schenck and Keyes both did poorly there. I don't think there's any real reason why those brigades should have broken. I mean, like I say, it was the first combat, but I mean, 40 casualties from a brigade? Now, if that had been like a battalion or something, I would say, yeah, fine. Let's have a quick read here. Oh, I closed it off already. Um, Battle of Manassas Junction has ended with the Army of Potomac retreating in panic. That's obviously their Army of the Potomac. I was still called the Army of Northeastern Virginia. Um, the enemy's reportedly suffered 3,972 casualties, 537 killed, and 156 captured. We will have to build some prisons. Uh, the morale is pleased to be stable. Our casualties were 1,700, 222 killed, 266 missing, the rest wounded. Morale's confidence, supply situation mediocre. We captured 2,000 rifles and 12 guns. Let's have a quick look if anything apparent was captured. Mm, possibly some howitzers, I'm not sure. 3-inch ordnance. We didn't have those. Oh, maybe we did, actually. 16 parrots. Handy. Maybe we captured some of those. I'm not sure. We definitely captured some Mississippi rifles. Uh, and some and some Springfield rifles as well. We've got 19,000 of them. We only had 18,000 before, and I've given some out. Springfield Muscatoon? Nah, I don't think so. We didn't find any cavalry there. I'm not sure, but we captured a few bits and pieces there, anyway. 3,000 main arts. Cool. Uh, okay, so let's just have a quick look at what I've been doing there. So, I, like I say, I added a few extra troops here um, into the Eastern HQ. That's now got 10,000 queued up. The Central HQ and the Winfield Scott also 10,000 men queued up. I added some more guns to that as well because we need to form like a core here from scratch, really, in, in this area. Uh, the Missouri Department, 7,725. Again, there's a few extra guns in there. Uh, I've created the first engineers and the banks. They're going to build some stuff for us uh, and the second engineers and the dicks up here Toledo Ohio but I'm moving them a little closer again they're going to build things for us like depots and forts on the river things like that uh, that's what I use these little engineering groups for um, this West Virginia militia I'm also going to use this as a recruiting force I think so we might have two on the go in this eastern theater but uh, it looks like we may fight a battle almost immediately following this because Joe Johnson's Army of the Shenandoah is racing across. Another thing worth looking at is that the Army of the Potomac is now going to be up to 33,000 men once they get their recruits in there. I don't think the AI, the Confederacy here, will suffer the same kind of way as we do by putting recruits straight into the Army. The readiness penalty, I mean. Which I think is because of the difficulty level. Um, and simply to give the AI a little hand up. Um, right, so what else have I done? Fleets. I have created a new fleet. The Blockading Squadron 1. I mean, it's not really the first one, but you know. <laughs> it's got two, four, six, seven ships in it. And we're going to blockade somewhere else. I'm just forming them up at Baltimore. So once they're all together, we'll send them out and we'll blockade somewhere. Uh, we're still waiting on this uh, USS Saratoga to be completed. There's a few other ships in dry dock getting built up. Uh, and we'll form another blockading squadron with that. I'm also queued up a bunch of double enders. I like those ships. They're handy to put in ocean going fleets or on the brown water fleet. I've queued up a few gunboats so we can flesh out that squadron at St. Louis. A few brigs just to fill up extra ships. 
a couple of steam frigates and some steamers. I didn't want to go too crazy with navy building because I think it's going to hit our economy quite hard because obviously ships are expensive. That should come as no surprise to anybody. But yeah, so like we're going to let those build up. We'll not build any more ships for a little while anyway. Uh, we've got some blockades in place, as I said. Um, we've just done Beauregard over. But like I say, this guy could be coming across here, George Johnson, for a scrap. But we are moving Mc uh, McDowell. McClellan is moving down towards Beverly. Um, and that should give him something else to think about. So we'll put McDowell at Beverly. We'll probably maybe build a fort there. Certainly a depot. It's going to be handy for our invasion and trying to separate West Virginia from Virginia. Because at this point, Virginia is just one big large state. West Virginia wasn't a state until 1863. I'm sure you know. All right, so Banks is at Philadelphia, actually, so I'm, I'm just moving him down. Same with this uh, this Eastern HQ. is moving down towards Washington. So, like, it's kind of... It acts as a recruiting unit and the last line of defense in case he ever rushes um, for Washington. Also, it should be pointed out, I've, I've added some tr uh, new commanders into some of the forts, political officers to give, to give us um, extra... Uh, to give us extra support in the states where they're from, like this guy, for example... Uh, he's actually, he's actually from North Carolina, this dude. Um, so I don't know if that makes any difference to the loyalty of North Carolina anyway, but like, it's, hel it's helpful to put political officers in these forts. And it means you don't have to give them real commands, because some of them are really crap. <laughs> uh, but yeah, so I've given out lots. Not all of them, but lots of them. Yeah, this guy, another one. Missouri, so it's going to give us some extra state support in Missouri, for example. This dude. Tennessee, again, handy. Uh, I must have changed him yet. But he's from Maryland, maybe I did. Anyway, uh, so that's that's where we're at. So we're going to need to form an army here in the central region. We need to form um, probably a larger force in Missouri for our invasion into Arkansas. But again, that's going to have to wait a little while. We've got lots to do. I'm just moving Lion down towards Springfield. We're going to build a depot here, maybe a fort, because this is quite an important little intersection. But then forts are not very effective, but quite expensive. They are quite effective on the river in terms of stopping fleets. But that's about it. Uh, so we've now got three ships in the Mississippi squadron. I've transferred in a gunboat and another steamer. Um, and what we added, actually, there's a naval battle happening just out here. The Savannah squadron has come and engaged us right here. But we should absolutely do them over. So we've already sunk the CSS Resolute and CSS Samson is disabled. So we should capture that. We'll send it back to dry dock and, you know, fix it up. Uh, if we capture any more ships, we'll do the same. We'll get some scouting squadrons out into these rivers, especially in this central region, into the Ohio River, down the Mississippi, if possible. But actually, there's a few forts we need to take care of, these three in particular. And then we're going to hit Nashville at some point. Depending on what the CSA does, it'll be interesting to see. But that's it for now. I hope you enjoyed this first episode, and I hope you're going to come back and watch more. Um, I always like to chat in the comments, so if you've got something to say, pop it in there. Whatever you're doing, whatever you're up to today, I hope you're having a great day, and I'll catch you later. I'll hopefully see you in the next episode. Ta-ra for now.